let's look at some typical non-dimensional numbers which are important in, in geophysical fluid dynamics. Um, the importance of rotation. We're talking about rotation and stratification. Okay? Importance of rotation, well, we compare the advection term with the Coriolis force. I'm sure you've seen this before. A lot of what I do today is revision, okay? But uh, I think it's a useful revision because I'm sure you've forgotten 99% of it, right? So, so um, if we compare this acceleration, this steady acceleration term with the Coriolis force, um, if the Coriolis force is important, then the ratio of the two, if you've done, you've done this scale analysis, so it's, it's the typical wind divided by F times a typical length scale. And if the rotation is important, then this number will be small. Okay? So your, this is called the Rossby number, and if it's small, then the flow is close to geostrophic. Okay? Then there's the Froude number, which is a bit more um, tricky. Um, we, let's, we talk about steady non-rotating flow, so this, this steady acceleration term is balanced by the uh, pressure gradient force. In that framework, we compare vertical divergence with horizontal divergence. So vertical divergence is dw by dz, horizontal divergence du by dx. If you do a scale analysis of that ratio, um, it's a rather intricate and complicated scale analysis, which if you want to see the details, you can talk to me afterwards or, or look in Cushman Rosen. Um, anyway, the result is um, the Froude number, which is U, the flow speed again, divided by N times H. N, remember, is the brunt weissler frequency. It's a vertical gradient of density. Okay? And H is typical thickness of your fluid. Right? And so um, that is also can be expressed as U divided by the root of G prime H, which is the gravity wave speed. Okay? And... Um, if the Froude number is small, then the stratification is important. The gravity waves are very fast. You have a kind of rigid system where there are not very big vertical excursions. You have fast gravity waves and not much communication between the layers. If the Froude number is large, then you have bigger vertical excursions of the flow. <coughs> so, which is the more important? Rotation or stratification? Well, it's not an interesting question at all. What's interesting is when they're both important, right? So we can actually divide one of these non-dimensional numbers by the other and come up with, um, well, the square of that is the Berger number, okay? And the Berger number is NH divided by FL, obviously, right? Or can also be expressed as root of G prime H over FL. And so when the Berger number is close to 1, that is when both rotation and stratification are important. And there are many different types of scale analysis that can lead to, to this situation. You can say that vorticity advection balances vortex stretching, um, for example. And, and you can back out a typical length scale out of this uh, at, at which these two processes are important. And it's called the Rossby radius. The Rossby radius is a fundamental important um, quantity in geophysical fluid dynamics. It's NH over F or root G prime H over F and it's the typical scale of these systems that I was showing you at the beginning, these cyclones and anticyclones in the atmosphere and in the ocean. You notice that they're much smaller in the ocean, right? That's because of uh, variations in the stratification. Let's talk about how we can simplify those equations that we were looking at earlier, the primitive equations. I showed you five equations, right? I showed you a set of five equations in these five variables, u, v, w, p, and rho. That's the primitive equations. Next step of simplification is to represent the stratification as finite layers, and that's the shallow water equations, right? And you can stack these layers on one on top of another, okay, to, to, to have a, a fairly intricate description of the flow. But still, only three variables. Each layer has just u, v, and h, the thickness of the layer. Okay? And then we can go one step further, and which we'll do next week, and we'll talk about the quasi-geostrophic system. And that, in that, you only have one variable. It's the stream function. Okay? I've written the vorticity there, or the potential vorticity there as well, because that's a, um, an important quantity. But you only need one variable to re resolve the quasi-geostrophic system. 
Um, so, shallow water equations, three variables, th three prognostic equations. Quasi-dystrophic system, one variable, one prognostic equation. Okay? Um, and so, we did, I've mentioned the stream function here. So for a quick recap on what does stream function mean uh, for you. Um, instead of talking about the two um, wind or current uh, components, you can talk about that in terms of uh, these derivatives, right? So let's say that our vector horizontal velocity can be expressed as a gradient of something plus uh, the vertical unit vector, the cross product of that with another gradient of something, okay? So this is the stream function. This is the velocity potential. So we've thrown out these two variables, u and v, but we've kept all the information because we have these two other variables, phi and psi, okay? So we've kept all the information, and we can write down u and v in terms of these two new variables. u is d phi, minus d phi by dx minus d psi by dy, and v is minus d phi by dy plus d psi by dx, okay? Now, what's the point of doing that? Well, often, we're interested in special cases. We're, we're interested in cases where there's no divergence, for example. Non-divergent flow. Now, non-divergent flow you can just cross out this term, right? So let's see there's no divergence, and you can just define um, the flow entirely in terms of the stream function. Or you can just, if you're only interested in the divergent part of the flow, you can do the opposite, and you can describe the flow entirely in terms of the velocity potential, right? There's a few other little consequences which are kind of neat. The divergence, grad dot v, is equal to the Laplacian of phi, and the relative vorticity psi, which is k hat dot grad cross v, okay? That's the curl of v. Um, that's the Laplacian of psi, okay? Just a few little facts. Right, now, how can we make our equations simpler? How can we... We're going to start on the, on the route now of, of transforming our primitive equations into shallow water equations. And the first thing to do is to transform the vertical coordinates. Right? So I'll, I'll take you through the process. It's, um, and there's a couple of rules we can derive which are quite, uh, quite general. So we can simplify the equations. And one really useful trick is to use a conserved quantity as your vertical coordinate. Right? So imagine what, what happens if you, if you have something which is conserved with the flow. And it's going up and it's going down and it's going from side to side and it's conserving this property. Right? So instead of using up as your vertical coordinate, you can use this property, which is conserving. So your vertical coordinate is no longer z, it's density, for example, in the ocean. We assume the, the ocean is incompressible, it conserves density. So here's, a, here's the surface of the ocean. These are density surfaces. And the flow is following them, of course, because it's not changing its density. Right? Now, if we just flip that and we say this, this is now density, this is in x rho space, okay? The flow is strictly horizontal. So there's no vertical velocity anymore. We've eliminated it from the equations. So that's quite useful. We've, we've removed one variable from our system. Okay? The price we pay for that is that the boundary condition is a bit more complicated because these, um, these surfaces actually intersect the surface of the ocean. And of course, they're moving around in time as well. So that complicates things. But let's go for it. Let's, let's just transform our equations into density coordinates. So here's a couple of general rules for doing coordinate transformations. So here's a zx space, and here's a surface, something which is constant. We'll say density, OK? And here's a variable phi. Now let's say we want to transform the horizontal derivative of phi between um, z coordinates and s coordinates, right? So the horizontal derivative on, a, on the S surface, it's phi C minus phi A, it's this minus this, divided by dx. That is the horizontal gradient on the S surface. Right? The horizon, horizontal gradient on the X surface, in the old Z coordinates, is phi B minus phi A over delta X. And to convert between the two, you also have to take account of the difference between phi C and phi B. 
of a delta z times dz by dx, that, that gives you the transformation. And that gives you rule number one, which is how to take a horizontal derivative in z space and translate it into a horizontal derivative in s coordinates. Right? Rule number two is straightforward. It's just d phi by dz. The vertical derivative is ds by dz times d phi by ds. So it just gives you the slope of that, of that surface as a conversion factor. Okay? So these two rules, we're going to apply them to our equations and see what happens. All right? um, so here's our um, hydrostatic equation. dp by dz is minus rho g. Use rule two. We get dp by d rho is minus rho g times dz by d rho. Okay. Now, we can introduce at this point a new variable, capital P, which is called the Montgomery potential, and which is just P plus rho g z. And if you substitute that in, you, what, what drops out is this very neat expression, d, big P by d rho. Okay. This is our new vertical coordinate density. It's just equal to g z. So big P is our new um, variable instead of pressure. Our new vertical coordinate is density, and we've got something that looks very much like the, what we had before, hydrostatic equation. Right? Momentum equations, D, well, this is big D by DT, so that's with all the advection terms in there, okay? Coriolis force, and then we want to transform this derivative, this horizontal derivative from Z to um, rho space, and it just drops out immediately that it's the Montgomery potential instead of pressure. Okay, so that's neat. Um, and, as I said, we've got rid of one term in the equations because there's no vertical velocity. There's no W. We don't cross density surfaces, so we don't go up and down, right, in, that, in those coordinates. So we just have, these are our equations now, uh, momentum equations with just these two advection terms. Continuity equation, we have du by dx plus dv by dy plus dw by dz. We need to transform these derivatives um, it's a bit more complicated. We use rules one and two, a bit of messing about, and we end up with this. It is a tendency equation expressed for this quantity, dz by d rho, which is kind of the stratification, okay? So it's like the tendency equation for the stratification, um, expressed in flux form. So it, these are fluxes of stratification. So it's the gradient of the flux of the the divergence of the flux of the stratification gives the tendency of stratification. And um, <coughs> we can uh, actually simplify that by saying if we have a discrete um, representation, we're talking about these layers now, then dz by d rho is going to become just h, which is the thickness of a layer, divided by a standard density difference delta rho between the layers. And that's how we're going to get to the shallow water equations. Okay, um, so here are some details of that, if you're interested in exactly how I did all that. It's all here for you, okay? You don't have to work it out yourself. It's all done for you. These, these slides, which have a kind of light blue background, are kind of you know, supplementary material, uh, which most of you will never, ever look at, okay? Um, there you go. So, let's get to the shallow water equations. So, let's put together a system in which we have a flat bottom, okay, and a fluid of a certain depth, okay? And the average depth of this fluid, the reference depth, is big H, which is a constant, okay? And we have these two layers. Simplest way to do what I want to do is with two layers. And the upper layer, well, there's, a, there's a free surface which can vary in time and position. The thickness of the upper layer is H1. The thickness of the lower layer is H2. And we have a density in the upper layer, rho naught, and a density in the lower layer, a bit denser, right? Rho naught plus delta rho. Okay, now, how are the variables going to change with depth through these layers, because some of them are piecewise constant and some of them are not. So this is a good point for me to make, it, make that clear, right? The density, obviously, 
is piecewise constant. There's only one density in this layer. Everywhere in this layer, it's all the same density. And in this layer as well. It's just a bit, a bit higher, the density in this layer. The pressure is not piecewise constant. The pressure changes continuously throughout the layer as you go down. Right? But since the density in each layer is constant, the horizontal gradient of the pressure in each layer is also constant. So the horizontal gradients of pressure are piecewise constant. They depend on the uh, layer depths and layer thickness. Which means that the flow speed, u and v, are also piecewise constant. So you only have one velocity in this layer and another one in this layer. So you can have three variables, u, v, and h, okay, which are piecewise constant in each layer. Well, just uniquely defined, if you like, in each layer. There's only one h1, there's only one u1, and only one v1, etc. Right? So let's work out what is the Montgomery potential um, in the upper layer, uh, the upper surface here, okay, and it is uh, rho gh, okay, that's the definition, it is p plus rho gh, so it's rho naught g, and so what is the height of this upper surface, it is, well, let's go down big h and then go back up h1 and h2, and we've arrived here at this surface, okay, and then I've added here in brackets plus the atmospheric pressure, okay, because if there are horizontal gradients in the atmospheric pressure, that's going to affect the dynamics, uh, we're going to neglect that. We're just going to assume the atmospheric pressure is constant, and we only care about horizontal gradients, so it will disappear. Okay? Now we can apply the hydrostatic equation. dP by d rho is delta P over delta rho. Okay? And so that is P2 minus P1 over delta rho, which is equal to GZ. And Z is here the height of the interface, so again, we go down big H, up H2, and there it is. So that will, applying that hydrostatic equation, allows us to find an expression for P2. So P2 is equal to P1 plus this. Okay? So now we know the Montgomery potential in both layers. Right? And we can take horizontal gradients of that to get our momentum equations. And that will lead to these these expressions. The horizontal gradient of P1 is given by G times the horizontal gradient of the complete depth of the fluid. Right? So, which means that the flow in, P, in, in the top layer depends only on the height of the free surface, which makes sense, right? Pressure gradients in the top layer depend on how far you've come down from the surface. Um, P2, D by, D by DX of P2, is equal to this same term plus something that modifies it, g prime dh2 by dx. So in the lower layer, we have what we call the barotropic mode, the external mode, plus a baroclinic contribution, right? dh2 by dx. And so that, that is something you can generalize. Um, throughout the fluid, there is always, you always feel the effect of the free surface this barotropic external mode. And then as you go down, layer by layer, you get different contributions from the um, stratification. Okay? So this is the barotropic part, and this is the baroclinic part. And the, and the important difference between the two is that this is multiplied by G, and this is multiplied by G prime. So G prime is much smaller than G, okay? which means that if you just move the upper surface a tiny bit, you can generate strong currents. Okay? If you want to generate strong vertical variations in the currents, the baroclinic part, then these, inter, these, these layers between the density surfaces have to move a lot more. Okay? You have to have much bigger horizontal gradients there to generate um, significant variation of current with depth, um, which you can do because you know, if you look at any... Uh, if you look at the ocean, for example, the free surface varies by a tiny amount, just a few centimetres, right? Whereas the thermocline, that varies by tens of metres, right, to 100 metres. So, um, all right, let's generalise this to many layers, okay? 
So what you end up with is an equation like this. You get horizontal gradients of the Montgomery potential. Now this bold P here is a vector. It's a column vector of all of the P in all the layers, P1, P2, P3, etc. And that is just this barotropic mode, the, the gradient of the free surface. And then G prime times this column vector of gradients of the layer thicknesses. So bold H, again, is a column vector, H1, H2, H3, etc. And that is multiplied by this matrix C, which couples all the layers together, right? So this is the coupling term between the layers. And for the two layers, it's very simple. It's just 0, 0, 0, 1, this C matrix, which gives us these two equations, right? And for N layers, it carries on like that, basically. You have a whole string of zeros which correspond to the barotropic mode. And then you have a bunch of ones, a bunch of twos, etc., all the way to n minus 1 in the corner there. So these two equations are, these two, these n equations are very strongly coupled. Okay? You can't just take one layer and say, let's solve for that layer. Let's solve for the flow in that layer. You need to know about the flow in every other layer, right? or the thicknesses of every other layer before you can solve it. So, so how do you do that? How do you decouple these equations to actually solve the problem? Well, instead of solving them layer by layer, you solve them mode by mode, and it involves finding the eigenvectors of this C matrix and transforming the variables so you have a set of decoupled equations. So then, just to recap, if we um, just put those um, expressions for the gradients of the Montgomery potential into the momentum equations, then we've just got a system there with three variables, uh, u, v, and h, okay? And here's the x momentum equation, here's the y momentum equation, and um, i is the index that refers to the layer number now, and uh, for i is greater than one, you have these extra terms. Um, for, um, well, this is a two-layer system, so for i is two, you've got these extra terms, these these baroclinic internal mode terms, right? The continuity equation is just the same for every layer. It's, it, you can actually talk about the continuity equation layer by layer, as you would expect, because in each separate layer, the mass must be conserved. So um, basically, you have convergence and divergence generating tendencies of layer thickness uh, separately in each, in each layer, right? Um, so for n layers, these are the momentum equations. It's, it's um, well, similar to what I was talking about before. These are the, 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 uh, the acceleration, or the, the Coriolis force, and then these two terms. Right? Um, so let's flip it over, OK? So what we started with was this sort of representation of the atmosphere, if you like. It was a flat bottom and a free surface. It could be the atmosphere, it could be the ocean, it could be a barotropic ocean, okay? So let's just think about one layer. That could be a barotropic ocean, or it could be a barotropic atmosphere, it doesn't matter, right? It's just a layer of fluid which wobbles around on a flat bottom, okay? And um, did I just say wobbles around on a flat bottom? Wonderful. Anyway, um, here is the free surface, and these are the equations that describe the, the dynamics. These are the two momentum equations, the continuity equation, same as before. And then if you want to transform that now to an oceanic case, what's interesting is that these equations don't change. They're exactly the same. Right? The only thing that changes is that you use G prime instead of G. So this is a situation where you have a rigid lid, so a surface which is you don't have a free variation in the surface anymore. You've clamped it down. You've put a, put a lid on it and uh, kept it flat, okay? But the thermocline can, can move around, okay? So you have the same uh, number of degrees of freedom. You have a one-layer system, right? But sometimes this is called a one-and-a-half-layer system because you have a fluid below this layer which doesn't move, okay? Uh, and it's represented, as I said, by the same set of equations, but with a reduced gravity. But if you, then if you look at the extended case where you have lots of layers. So you have this rigid lid and you have many layers in the thermocline right? and then you have the abyss which is always 
motionless. Okay? Then you have a different development equation. You've lost the barotropic part. Right? You've lost the effect of the free surface. There is no uh, big D term. Right? You've just got this G prime C matrix term. And the C matrix is flipped. It's the other way around. And crucially, it doesn't have any zeros in it. Okay? It just has the last row is, and column is, is ones. So you've got one extra baroclinic mode instead of the barotropic mode, and you have no external mode. Okay? Let's go back to thermal wind balance. This, it's kind of interesting to think of thermal wind balance in terms of the change of density across a surface. Okay? So you have a, a layer boundary here. And say on the left of this layer boundary, you have cold air. And on the right, you have warm air. So the density here is a bit greater than the density here. Okay? And if you form the thermal wind balance equation in, in, in these coordinates, so it's d squared of the Montgomery potential by dx d rho, it gives you this. Okay? And it tells you that the difference, if you like, of in, the, in the wind between the warm air and the cold air, dv by d rho, so the difference across this boundary depends on the slope of that boundary, dz by dx. What is the slope of that boundary? So the, the, the more slope there is in your front, the stronger the wind uh, shear across it will be. This relationship here, which, which gives you the, the difference in the wind from one side of the boundary to the other, as the slope of the boundary, that's called Margul's relation. It's, it's the simplest uh, expression for um, representing fronts in the atmosphere. In the ocean, you can also think about this in an oceanographic uh, context. And you have, um, imagine you're in a boat on the surface of the ocean and you want to um, measure the slope of the thermocline and deduce something about the currents because of the slope of the thermocline. So you can go to one place, measure the, measure the depth of the thermocline there, go to another place, measure the depth of the thermocline there, calculate the slope, calculate the difference in currents across that, that density surface. Um, it won't tell you the actual currents. It'll just tell you the difference across the density surface. And that's the problem that oceanographers have. Oceanographers, sometimes they call that the geostrophic current. It's not really the geostrophic current. It's the vertical gradient of the geostrophic current. They don't know what the geostrophic current is. Because for that, you need to know the slope of the surface. And from a boat, you can't work that out. You need a satellite to work that out. Okay, so... Um, so um, but you can, you know, if you make an assumption that the abyssal flow is, is weak, then you can deduce from that assumption what the thermocline flow is. And uh, you can do that with these instruments which measure um, temperature and salinity and, and, and pressure, CTD instruments. As I say, you want to know the full current, you need to, know, you need to have some way of looking at the free surface. And, or you can just use a current meter. Right? Um, Final note on thermal wind balance. Now, I've, you've heard of the vorticity equation, right? We're going to do that soon. The vorticity equation, normally, when you think about it, you think about the horizontal uh, flow, okay? And the vorticity itself is actually a vector which points upwards, okay? And it can actually point in other directions as well. So if you think of the vorticity as a vector that points upwards for the horizontal flow, you can have horizontal components of the vorticity, um, which describes the overturning flow. Right? Now, the thermal wind balance expresses just that. It expresses the horizontal component of the vorticity equation. So what you think of as the vorticity equation normally is the equation for the vertical component of the vorticity. Right? Thermal wind balance is the equation for the horizontal components of the vorticity. Um, and it's not, it doesn't have anywhere near the same amount of liberty as the vertical component because it's locked into this balance. It's, it's, there's no, um, the, the, the hydrostatic effect, uh, balance is so strong that uh, there's no real, uh, a, a, this, a zero order, there's no real development in this, in this uh, horizontal component of the vorticity. 